Thank you, Carol, and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the kickoff of OFA's 42nd Annual Conference. Uh, let me be the first to offer a, a huge shout out to the OFA staff for making this gathering happen despite all of the challenges that a global pandemic creates. Uh, and thanks also to our presenting sponsor, Turner Farm, for their unwavering support. But most of all, thank you uh, for attending here tonight. Uh, as a reminder, if you have questions for our speaker, uh, please use the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, type your question, and I will present those to Will uh, later in the evening. You know, I've stood, or in this case, sat in front of this group on multiple occasions over the past few years, but never have I been as excited as I am tonight. Not because of what I get to say, but because of what and from whom we get to hear. Mr. Will Harris is the fourth generation to guide White Oak Pastures his family's 154-year-old farm in Bluffton, Georgia. With his daughters and grandchildren alongside him, will practice multi-species regenerative grazing, humane animal husbandry, regenerative land management, and zero waste production methods. For myself, as a livestock farmer turned grazing consultant, I think you can start to see where my excitement is for tonight and where it stems from. There's a lot of people in the agricultural community asking important questions like, can you actually scale regenerative practices to a regional or national level? Can pastured livestock really provide solutions to climate change and soil health? And is it possible to simultaneously regenerate land, treat animals humanely, produce a clean, healthy product, and grow the size of your farm? But with all those people asking the questions, honestly, there's very few providing any answers. Will Harris is one of those people providing real solutions. So whether I'm talking grazing in a conference hotel bar over his version of a glass of wine, or touring his amazing farm in Bluffton, or watching him personally challenge Vice President Al Gore to properly recognize the positive climate contributions of regenerative farmers, I am continually struck by the contrast that Will represents. He's a legit OG in the rotational grazing world, a champion for regenerative farmers across the nation, and a critical voice in the growing conversations surrounding climate change. Yet despite all of that high level effort, Will is as grounded, rooted, and real a farmer as they come. He is and will always be one of us. Please welcome to tonight's virtual stage, my hero and my friend, Mr. Will Harris. Well, thank you for those kind words, Paul. It was mighty, mighty flattering. Uh, it meant a lot coming from you. I, I, I hold you in very high regard. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with you all tonight. Uh, uh, aside from any technical difficulties, I am profoundly Southern and my accent is thick. So I am going to try to carefully enunciate the words that come out of my mouth. Hopefully you'll You'll understand me. Uh, <clears throat> White Oak Pastures is our family farm. It's a multi-generational, multi-species, vertically integrated farm. Been in my family for 155, I think, years. <clears throat> we pasture raise five different red meat species, cows, hogs, sheep, goats, and rabbits. And we hand butcher them in the USDA inspected a slaughterhouse that we built here on the farm. We pasture raise five different poultry species, chickens, turkeys, geese, guineas, and ducks. And we hand butcher them in a separate USDA inspected slaughterhouse that we built here on the farm. We raise certified organic vegetables, pastured eggs, honey, and a number of other we have a number of other little ancillary businesses that go to support the organism that we call white oak pastures. Uh, I'm going to get my, uh, my daughter to start a little PowerPoint uh, presentation. It's, it's, not, it's not a presentation, actually. It's just pretty pictures of the farm so you can see what we do without looking at me. So uh, I'm going to continue to speak to you when she gets it started. I won't be speaking from the slides. This is just because a picture is worth a thousand words. Jenny, come back. I noticed over oh, there.
So I guess the, <clears throat> the thing that I in, in, enjoy the most about our farm is how in the now six generations, the farm has come full cycle. You know, when my grandfather, great grandfather and grandfather ran the farm, it was before my, my time in terms of being able, my, my recollection, but I know that they would have farmed in a manner that was very focused on the animals and the land and the community because that's how people farmed in the late 1800s and early 1900s. My father was born in 1920, took over the farm post-World War II, 1946. Uh, his generation really revolutionized uh, agriculture in this country. Uh, you know, it, it was in three different areas and we could talk about them all day, but his generation industrialized, commoditized, and centralized production. And under his watch, and it was done for noble reasons. You know, it was post-World War II, Europe was starving. There was a desperate need for cheap, uh, uh, abundant, safe food. And the, the infrastructure from World War II was, was uh, able to be repurposed for the, the industrialization. And my father's generation it, it made it a, a, a wild success. Food you know, in, that, in that production model became obscenely cheap and wastefully abundant and safe, probably mostly in the acute sense that you didn't eat it and fall over with a, with a disease. And, and you know, the, it, while it was wildly successful in making food cheap and abundant, uh, there were unintended consequences. And those unintended consequences fell on the backs of the land and the animals in rural communities. Uh, I went to the University of Georgia, graduated from the College of Agriculture in 1976 with a degree in, in animal science. And I came home and further industrialized the farm. Uh, you know, under my watch, uh, we, we, we really gained a lot of uh, a lot of productivity. Uh, uh, we, uh, it had become a monoculture of only cattle as opposed to a polyculture, much like it is today when my great grandfather and grandfather had it. And the farm was, was uh, financially successful. You know, we weren't rich people, but we paid taxes every year and lived to be comfortable and lived very comfortably. I, 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 I don't think my father ever lost money in a year, and I know I didn't. So I farmed that way from 1970s, ran the farm that way from 1976 to the mid 90s. And in the mid 90s, I started uh, changing the way I felt about things. I, uh, I, get, I was becoming increasingly aware of the impact of the production model I was part of, the unintended consequences of using those tools of reductionist science given us to, to increase yield. So I started making changes, just very subtle at first and more and more and more. Today, the three basic tenets of white oak pastures are animal welfare, regenerative land management, and re-enriching this local rural community. And for me, the canary in the coal mine, the first thing that I became aware of the unintended consequences was the animal welfare. Again, it was a monoculture of cattle at that time. I used uh, uh, subtherapeutic antibiotics and ionospores and wormers and uh, all, all the uh, hormone implants, all the tools. And I, I, I yeah, you know, animal welfare for, for me had always meant uh, you keep the animals uh, fed, well fed, well watered, in a comfortable temperature range. And you don't intentionally inflict pain and suffering on them. And that was good animal welfare. You, you, you hit off, pushed all the, all the buttons. But for me, I started to believe that in addition to those things, it was necessary that I give the animals and create an environment in which they could express instinctive behavior. And we did that and I liked it a lot better. 
I, I quit using all those tools. I, up until that time, I'd had a feedlot. I fed corn and soy in confinement, and I gave that up with a grass-fed program. <clears throat> While I was still making those changes, I started becoming increasingly focused on what I was doing to my land. You know, I could walk in the edge of the woods and, 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 and the soil was a, an organic medium that was just teeming with life. And I could walk out there in my field and it was a dead mineral medium that, 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 that was not teeming with life. And the difference was that in the edge of the woods, I was not using uh, cultivation and chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And I wanted the land in the field looked like the land in the edge of the woods. So I quit using those tools. And that, that was a little more painful economically than, than when I ceased to use the products on the animals. But, but we did it and, uh, and we didn't make as much money as we had previously. So it became apparent to me that I needed to find a way to extract the additional value I was putting in my products. At that time, it was still a monoculture of, of, of beef. So I created the brand White Oak Pastures. White Oak Pastures had been a farm at that time for 150 years, but we, we, we reinvented it as a brand. And I started marketing my grass-fed beef, and it, it caught traction. And I could, I could tell that that was probably a, a workable solution, but I was using outside uh, uh, slaughterhouses, little abattoirs. I was using their excess capacity. And uh, they I, they ran out of capacity before I got profitable. Like I liked the direction it was headed in, but they, you know, I would call and say, I need to bring 12 head. And they say, no, you can only bring six. And I really needed to bring 12. I just couldn't do enough volume to make it work for naturally. So we built the first processing plant was the red meat slaughterhouse. And uh, kind of a little side note, uh, I was blessed to inherit a, a nice farm. I'd inherited a thousand acres of land, a good herd of cows and some other, other, other assets, farm assets and a little money. And we'd made money, uh, not a lot, we had a little bit. So uh, I decided to build my, my first slaughterhouse uh, and, and I've never borrowed a penny in my life, but I borrowed about seven and a half million dollars in the next few years that went primarily for uh, infrastructure to process my animals. Along that line, I had moved from a monoculture home with cattle to other species. And, you know, uh, people don't, consumers don't buy cows and hogs and sheep. They buy beef and pork and lamb. So I, I had to make that, that conversion so I could monetize my products. So I did. And we were blessed. Uh, that was at the time when grass-fed beef and other pasture uh, proteins was, was catching traction. I actually sold Whole Foods Market the first pound of American grass-fed beef that they marketed as American grass-fed beef. That was around about year 2000, I think. So we moved forward with that and uh, sadly, and, 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 and it was profitable. We, we, were, doing, we were doing well, uh, again, not, not rich people, but we were living comfortably and paying our bills, paying back that seven and a half million dollars I'd borrowed. By the way, we still hadn't paid it all back, but we made progress with it. Uh, so uh, that, I thought that was the way that was going to be. Uh, I would produce it and grocery stores would sell it. And uh, we still sell to Whole Foods Market and Publix and Kroger, and they're wonderful people. They're all great folks, and I enjoy doing business with them. But we have struggled to stay in that uh, system. Uh, you know, uh, industrial, fact, we'll call it factory farms, and uh, big multinational food companies and grocery stores and food services all evolved, co-evolved together beginning post-World War II. And that co-evolution created a codependency. So there's a, they all need each other. No two can work without the third one. 
And we're, pretty, we're a fairly large farm, a family-owned operation, but we struggle to stay in that, that little uh, food, sock food production, food delivery system. And uh, when the pandemic hit uh, about this time last year, uh, we had started, we were very fortunate, we had started a online uh, uh, market uh, delivering through FedEx and UPS uh, directly to consumers. And thank goodness we did because overnight, the food service component of our business dried up. We were also selling to Cisco and the other, uh, other food uh, big food distributors, uh, food service distributors. And our online business caught traction and uh, it, it made up for what we lost. Now we're, we're not doing more volume than now than we were then, but the food service business went away, grocery business remained stable and the online uh, service uh, uh, delivery uh, went up. So I've told you a little bit about the, what's the three, three tenets that are important to us. I told you about the animal welfare, I told you a little bit about um, uh, the, the land, uh, regenerative land management part. And the third part that I just mentioned is financially uh, re-enriching our local community. And I'm very proud that we've been able to do that. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But what's kind of interesting to me, hope it is to you, is the, the choices and changes we made with reference to the land and the animals were very, very intentional. You know, I knew what I was doing pretty well as an industrial farmer. Uh, I studied the system, uh, made some decisions about things I wanted to change. I changed them. Some worked, some didn't. The ones that didn't work, I changed again. And the change, my point is the changes I made for the land and the animals were uh, very thoughted choices, very intentional. The impact on the community was very unintentional. It was very organic. Uh, Bluffton, Georgia, uh, the, the farm, Bluffton, Georgia is right in the middle of my farm. The farm's about four miles long, about a mile wide, and it does this. Uh, we know we have some spots we don't own in that range, uh, uh, but it's contiguous, uh, just the places we don't have. Uh, but Bluffton, and Bluffton sits right in the middle of it. And uh, Bluffton had been reduced, a thriving little town, incorporated city, east of Mississippi, had been reduced to well under 100 people. The only thing you could buy in Bluffton was a postage stamp. About two hours a day, you could buy a stamp, you could hit it right. And had, there hadn't been a new housing start since 1972. Zero new housing starts from 1972 until 2016. So today, fast forward, uh, Bluffton, uh, we have 176 employees here on this farm. This is a, we're the largest employer in the county. The county is one of the poorest counties and one of the poorest states in the union. And uh, we have 176 employees, a payroll of $100,000 every Friday. The, uh, uh, when we brought that many talented, smart, educated, energetic, hardworking people here, they, had, they needed things. They needed a place to eat and sleep and drink and play and shop. So we built them. We renovated them, bought a lot of those old houses and renovated them. Uh, we built a store, a restaurant, uh, got lodging and form of cabins on the farm. Or, uh, we took three meals a day, seven days a week. And Bluffton and now has gone from a, literally a ghost town to a little destination. And I'm very, very proud of that. That was, uh, it was accidental. I didn't intend to do it. We deserve no credit for it, but it's very, very pleasing to me. And I guess the point I wanted to make in that is uh, what, I think that every, you know, the, you know, there's a Bluffton in every rural county in this country. 
a little town or more than one little town that's just drying up. And what we have learned is those little towns are drying up or have dried up because factory farming, centralized farming, made the towns irrelevant. They didn't need them anymore. And when we changed the way we farm, those little towns became economically relevant again for the reasons I told you. Bring people in, they needed, they needed services. And I'm belaboring that point to you because what the, the impact we've had here in Bluffton is highly replicatable. Highly replicatable. It's not highly scalable. White Oak Pastures won't be re-enriching any other little town. Bluffton's the only one we're going to do. But that could be one or two or three White Oak Pastures in every agricultural county in this country. And there should be. And when I say there could be, uh, you know, I am a C student, a proud C student. Uh, I'm the Economically, you know, I was financially able to get bank loans, but there was no trust fund. So renovating a little town, re-enriching a little town can be done by a C student with bank debt. So that's highly replicatable. You can do it over and over again. Uh, we do have an internship program that we're proud of. Uh, we, we started it in self-defense. I didn't particularly want an intern program because I didn't want food with it. But we had a lot of, we were inundated with people that wanted to come. So we, we sat down and, and kind of forged one. And uh, we bring in uh, about six students per quarter, uh, four times a year, three month period, four times a year, about six new ones every time. And we get, uh, we get 20 something uh, uh, applications uh, that we are able to choose the six out of. And while I kind of went kicking and streaming into the intern business, uh, I'm really uh, pleased that we did uh, because we've gotten some wonderful employees from it. One thing I'd like to tell you about this uh, new to us that uh, I'm, I'm excited about is uh, we, about, about uh, one year ago, one year ago now, uh, we <clears throat> signed a contract with a solar, uh, you know, a renewable energy provider, a solar voltaic company called Silicon Ranch in Nashville. They had bought a 1,425-acre property uh, six miles from here. And they uh, have always used only uh, uh, industrial vegetation control, Roundup, string trimmers, mowers. And we convinced them to let us have the vegetation contract and do it with, uh, with animals. And the only animals that can work for me under those panels are sheep and poultry. We're grazing that 1,425 acres and we are delighted with that program. And I think that, uh, I think that the, the Silicon Ranch people are too. So I think that's going to be a growing opportunity for people to expand their farms. And uh, you know what, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll hush about now and see if there are any, any questions. I hope there are because I would much rather respond to what you want to hear than to try to figure out what you might want to hear about and pontificate about it. So Paul, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, sir, we sure do. Um, so they were talking, uh, Joyce was asking about when you applied for that loan, the seven and a half million dollars, uh, what were the the main tenants of your proposal? How did you justify that amount? Uh, and what did you have to say to sell the idea uh, to the, the money lenders? That is, that is very flattering to think that I would have had a presentation because I certainly did not have one. You know, this, uh, this, this was done 20, 25 years ago and banking has changed dramatically since then. Uh, when I borrowed the money, it was just, uh, you know, I hate to say it like that. It was just good old boy collateral based lending. By the way, I didn't borrow the seven and a half million dollars at one time. Uh, I built this red meat plant, which is where I'm sitting right now, is about 
two million. Uh, later I built the poultry plant, later I built the value addition, later I built the warehouse, and you know, it was it was done incrementally over some many year period, but it was all collateral based lending. At that time I'd never put together any sort of I was not asked to get his own business plan. We probably, you know, me and my banker, who I'd known all my life, probably sat by and, and he probably scribbled out some kind of cash flow projections, which were Walt Disney could have done them uh, because I, I had no idea how it was going to work. But uh, uh, and I'll say this: uh, <clears throat> it was uh, it, it was a very stressful period for me. Uh, I told you that uh, we had been profitable every year for as long as I've been alive, my father, then me, and uh, we borrowed, and with no debt, we borrowed all that money, and I went for some years, I, I was losing money, and that was very, very stressful for me, uh, we were blessed, it turned around, and I'll say this, we still have cash flow problems, it is not all sweetness and light, uh, our business, we do 20 something million dollars worth of business a year, and the margins are remarkably thin. I know probably everybody, I see 157 participants on the screen, probably every single one of y'all know how thin the margins are. And uh, we have years that we, we make practically no money, but we're able to, you know, if I can make debt service and live, uh, you know, we'll, we'll fight another day. Uh, Corinne Steele uh, asks how COVID has affected your farm. Uh, not to say I'm flippant, but if it weren't for the media, we wouldn't know there was a pandemic. Uh, we got 176 employees in, in, in two packing plants, as well as out in the field. You know, those guys, uh, I'm, I'm part of the field crew. We, we're, we're, we've been socially distanced. I've been socially distanced for 66 years. But the, uh, uh, in the packing plant here, we went for a long time and had just a very small number of positives. Today, we've had a good many positives. We've had zero hospitalizations, nobody particularly sick. Uh, you know, we, it, it was just a mild flu season here. Uh, Jenny just reminded me. Uh, that uh, we actually have 20 more employees today than we did this time last year. And that's a function of the uh, online business uh, increasing dramatically. And the online business is a lot more people intensive. You know, the, we make more margin on the online business than we do the wholesale business, but there's a lot of extra expense to it, and that extra expense is primary, primarily uh, labor, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of it, I'm not, a, uh, I'm just, it's not all sweetness and light, but it's, it's a good business. Uh, Xavier wants uh, a little more information about uh, any feedback you've received, perceptions uh, from your either conventional uh, animal producing neighbors, or maybe even on a regional or national scale, what's the reaction to your type of agriculture and your uh, blunt, uh, unapologetic uh, ways of, of uh, discussing it. How do you find that received in the conventional world? You know, uh, I don't think that farmers uh, bear any resentment for this kind of farming or offer a lot of support for this kind of farming. And there may be exceptions, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's a real big deal either way. Now, uh, big industrial ag companies are, uh, you know, they, they're, I think we're the enemy. Uh, I don't think they necessarily begrudge what we sell. They begrudge that our message is, this is how we produce it. And, and, and this is how they produce it. And uh, my, what I consider to be uh, consumer education, they consider to be criticism. And that's okay because I consider what they do in greenwashing. So there's a, there is an adversarial uh, air, uh, not, but not at the farmer level, but more at the uh, agribusiness level. Um, so obviously, as you talk about your operation and you, you know, a mile wide and 
four miles long. Um, that yeah, sounds... there, are places we, there are places we don't own in that. <laughs> sure, that's fair. But uh, to somebody just starting out, how, how do you, what would you recommend or is there any advice that you would give to somebody who's looking at just getting started from the very beginning? Any uh, uh, words of wisdom that you could share with them? Well, I'm probably not the best person to ask <clears throat> because I didn't build a farm from scratch. I converted an industrial farm <clears throat> to a, a kinder, gentler kind of production model. Uh, but I, I do have one bit of advice that I think is important <clears throat> is uh, a question that I get all the time is at what scale does it work? And uh, the, I, I have a, a definite opinion on that. And that is any scale can work. Little bitty or great big, any scale can work. What's important is, and what people forget is, there are three legs on the stool. I've already talked about this a little bit. There's production out there in the pasture. And that's the fun part. That's what we all want to do. We all enjoy uh, uh, making the land and the animals better. And, and we, that, that's just a lot of fun. If you don't enjoy that, it's something wrong with the, the, you. But, but as I told you, people don't buy cows and hogs and sheep. They buy beef and pork and lamb. So you have got to work out the processing side of it. In my case, I had to go big because I didn't have processing here to support me, but I didn't want to. So you got to grow it, produce it, you got to process it, and then you got to market it. And you know, if, you're, if you've got a, uh, a vegetable farm in the edge of a, a big, uh, a wealthy city. I mean, you can operate on such a small scale and it'll work and it's great. If you were in a uh, more rural area where the market is not sophisticated enough to pay a premium for your products, you probably got to got to got to get a little bigger and do more of the processing and marketing yourself. But the good news is, the further from that big city you get, the cheaper the land gets, so the scale is is workable. But the farmers that I've seen fail, I've seen, I've seen farmers fail that were a lot smarter than me and had a lot more money than me. And they did it because they focused exclusively on the production and didn't uh, focus on how they're going to monetize it. You got to monetize it. Would you say that you are working uh, harder or uh less compared from your conventional background to where you're doing regenerative operations now when you that transition is that as hard or different kind of hard um well i'd say i'd say this is not what uh, the other way was much harder and this way is much more pleasant uh you know i i i, I think i work quote work in quote seven days a week and probably 12 hours a day but, you know, I want, everything I'm doing, I want to do. So, you know, I don't know how you exactly call that work. Now, uh, so this it's better in every sense of the word, except this is better than what I used to do. In every sense of the word, except it may be more stressful. You know, uh, uh, both industrial agriculture and this kind of agriculture uh, are both very capital intensive and both operate on very thin margins. But in the industrial model, there's a lot of safety nets put in place. You know, there's federally subsidized crop insurance, there's a very established marketing order, there's you know, irrigation for drought, there's hedging the commodities on the board trade. I can't do, I don't do any of those. So in both cases, capital intensive, in both cases, uh, uh, thin margins, but I'm working without a net. It's uh, uh, the, the risk to reward ratio that you learned about in basic economics is not real good where I live. Uh, Jenny's obviously uh, listening aptly uh, right next door and ready to step in at a moment's notice. Um, there's a question from, uh, from Joyce. Hi, hey, Jenny. Hello. Uh, how do you, uh, do you have any advice for working cooperatively with family? 
Um, there, this specific question says they live on a 300 acre multi-generational farm and working cooperatively is their biggest challenge. Any wisdom to add from uh, Will or, or Jenny for that matter? Um, you know, so my dad and his father uh, butted heads pretty seriously uh, back when he was a young man. And there was probably a lot of alpha male in both of them that prevented them from having a real workable relationship. Um, dad and I work great together. Um, you know, I'm scared to death that I'm going to disappoint him and he's scared to death that he's going to hurt my feelings. Uh, and that seems to be a really good balance. Um, now I do have a sister who's three or four years younger than me. Uh, and we will knock heads pretty good. Uh, so the balance that we've found is working far enough away from each other uh, that we don't necessarily depend on each other, but close enough that we can enjoy each other. So she manages uh, tourism and farm experience, and I'm the director of marketing. Uh, and then we just went ahead and complicated it all together and brought back our spouses. And so it's just, uh, you know, but in all honesty, um, the business is big enough that we can spread out and not uh, not necessarily have too much time to focus on what the other one's not doing a good job on. Uh, I have a question for uh, sort of along the same lines of things, but more from a legal or business orientation organization. How do you separate or do you and how do you separate all your individual enterprises? Are they separate? LLC is cooperatively owned, any um, co-owned with employees, any ideas like that from a business perspective? Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pretty simple man. And uh, you know, we've, got, we've got one bank account. It's called White Oak Pastures. And all the money goes in it and all the bills are paid out of it. So, uh, you know, I do own 100% of the company. Uh, we, we have a bonus program for employees. Uh, I have not figured out how to share ownership per se. I'm not opposed to it, but I'm not quite sophisticated enough to do that. Uh, we do have a, uh, a very sophisticated accounting system. We've got a controller who uh, I think they keep uh, 50 something. 52. 52 different departments. departments. So you know, there, there's, uh, there's a, uh, you know, Cows, hogs, sheep, goats, rabbits, red meat processing, poultry processing, the store, the restaurant, the lodging, rat, you know, there's a, it's a, it, the, the accounting is very complex. And we've got a smart lady that, that has a staff of people that do it. Awesome. Well, we've got uh, uh, multiple questions that are looking for more uh, information on a very operational level about uh, everything from breed selection to multi-species synergies and how you chose uh, uh, to mix and match and what works with what. Can you give us a little more of a sense of, uh, and there was one question about uh, the uh, Iberico projects, uh, which for the hogs, I believe. Iberico. Um, so just in general, can you uh, talk a little bit more about what your operation looks like on a day-to-day -day and, and uh, farmer to farmer? Yeah, that's a, that's a big old can of worms, and I'm happy to talk about any of it, but I don't know if I can attack the whole uh, month in that way. Uh, uh, so the farm, I'll try. So the farm is, uh, the, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not addressing the solar property. That's, that's managed very differently. But the, the farm here, the 3,200 acres, is divided up into 100 and something 30-ish acre paddocks. And uh, we, uh, for the cattle, uh, we have uh, three herds. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And we move, we move them every day during the growing season. The growing season from us is about the middle of February, like about now, uh, uh, till about Thanksgiving, maybe a little later than that. And we move, move the cattle every day. Uh, and so if you've got 100 pastures, in three herds, you got 33 rotations. That's, that's, that's not quite how it works, but kind of. <clears throat> and that's where that is. We've got three herds of cows because uh, we have a 
winter calving drove of mama cows and a summer calving drove of mama cows and a finishing bunch of bulls. <clears throat> we, uh, I say bulls because they're bulls. I ceased to castrate male cattle about eight or so years ago. And when we wean them, they go in the bull herd, which is the finishing herd. We slaughter about two years of age. That's approximate. I don't keep individual birth records. I keep herd birth records. So I know about when they're born, but not exactly when they're born. And one thing that's interesting, you mentioned breed. Uh, um, my great-grandfather brought a herd of cracker cattle here uh, in 1866. And it was a closed herd. He saved bulls, saved heifers, and raised cattle. My grandfather, I think, maybe my father, somebody started buying purebred bulls in the early 1900s and uh, to improve improve the herd. And, I, and my father did that all his career, and I did it for 20 years plus years, probably 20, probably, probably 30 years. <clears throat> and I mongrelized the hell out of the herd. Between my father and I, we probably have had at least one of every breed of bull that's ever been to Georgia, from Brahman to Hereford to Angus to Charley, Simmental, you name it, we, we've had a bull, flavor of the month kind of a deal. And <clears throat> I was still buying bulls when I quit Cash Street castrating my own bulls. And I realized that I was raising better bulls than I was buying. So I ceased to buy bulls. I saved my own, and that, which makes it a closed herd, which is essentially building your own breed. And we've been doing that for probably about six years now, and I really like it. You know, we, we, uh, when we, we, we don't castrate any, any bulls. We uh, grow them to two years of age. If we like them, we turn, turn them back out for breed bulls. If we don't like them, we bring them up here to the slaughter plant. And I, I really think I'm making genetic progress. I'm asked if I'm worried about interbreeding. And I'm not worried about it. I know it can happen. I, I watch it closely. We've got a lot of genetics out there. And I think, I'm, I think it's going to be okay. Uh, will you talk a little bit about how you see pastured livestock uh, being part of the solution and part of the conversation as, as climate issues and climate change uh, eats up, no pun intended? Absolutely. And I just realized that the title of this was uh, Generating Land with Livestock, and I hadn't talked about it too much. So let me do so. Uh, first of all, uh, I hope that uh, those of you who are interested will look on our website, whiteoakpastures.com, in the land stewardship section, you'll see a LCA, life cycle assessment, that was done by an environment, environmental engineering uh, firm in, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, a couple of years ago. And they determined that we actually are, our cattle are actually sequestering more carbon than they're emitting. In the last 10 years, we've been told that cattle are destroying the earth with their flatulence and burps and methane and, and all that. And, you know, when I first started hearing that, I neither believed it nor disbelieved it because I didn't have an opinion. And, uh, but I, I, I did know that my soil was getting better and better. And, and then that LCA life cycle assessment will show you that. That's why I want you to look at it. And, and I, didn't need, I didn't need that expensive study to show me that. I mean, I could see it. You know, I could walk on it. Uh, the, the land looks different. The pieces of land I don't own in that strip that we call White Oak Pastures, the land looks definitely remarkably different from the land on my side. And the difference is, is uh, no tillage, no chemical fertilizer, no pesticide, and proper animal impact. And proper animal impact means hard animal rotation with a long recovery time. It's biomimicry, emulation of nature, uh, re returning to the days when 
wolves moved bison across the plains or lions moved gazelles and wildebeest across the plains or polar bears moved caribou across the tundra. Uh, and it, 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 I would suggest to you that the only cost effective way to uh, renovate uh, uh, the degraded land is through the use of animal impact. You know, Bill Gates might could do it, but the only cost effective way to do it is with animal impact. And we could talk about that all day, don't get me started. But you know, when I, I'll say this, 25 years ago, when I said, I want the dirt in the woods to look like the soil, excuse me, the dirt in the field like the soil in the woods, I didn't say, you know, I believe I can help mitigate climate change by changing the way I farm. Had nothing to do with climate change, had nothing to do with uh, greenhouse gases being sequestered in the soil. But the positive unintended consequence is when I made my land better, I did contribute to that. Uh one of the questions is uh, from folks, and please continue to keep them coming, y'all. Um, it's 8.06, so we've got time on the schedule. Uh, who or what was your inspiration for change? Uh, and there's another question that's sort of tied to that as well that talks about, or you mentioned several years where, where you, you didn't make money. I mean, overall, the farm did, but what kept you going in those times when in that tough transition between uh, the conventional and, and, and what you're doing now? Uh, and then overall, just what was your inspiration for and what kept you going in those times? Well, no, no person was my inspiration. You gotta remember this is the 1995 and there weren't many people practicing what we now call regenerative farming. In fact, me and Gabe Brown in North Dakota and just a very small handful of others and we didn't know each other. so. There just wasn't much of it going on 25 years ago. Uh, my inspiration came from my observation. And my observation of, of, of what we were doing to the land and the animals and later the community. And my, my, my observation didn't come from the fact that I'm such a sensitive soul. I am not. Uh, my... my me being, uh, becoming uh, sensitized, noticing unintended consequences came from the fact that I was an abuser. You know, if you, if, if, if you drink a, a shot of whiskey every night, you're never going to think of the ills of alcohol. If you, think, if you drink a fifth of bourbon every night and don't miss a night, it's probably going to take its toll. And I was more that guy. Uh, a little is good, more is better. Uh, I don't have a tattoo, but if I had one, that's probably what it would have said. Uh, you know, if, 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 the, if the, this is not flattering to me, but if the, if the label rate said to put a pint per acre, I probably put a quart per acre. And if it said give them two cc's, I probably gave them three cc's. So that made me, uh, the, the, the unintended consequences more noticeable. Uh, unintended consequences are, are unnoticed consequences and usually unwanted consequences, but not always. Uh, do you do any outwork or education efforts to teach others about the importance of transitioning or <laughs> regenerative agriculture? Uh, what are your outreach? Um, you know, that's evolving. Uh, first of all, let me say that I am not an evangelist. I'm not going door-to-door -door handing out Bible tracts, telling people how they need to farm. Uh, I farm the way I want to farm. I like to see other people transition to this sort of farming, but uh, it's not in my job description to convert as many people as I can. I am not in that business. Now, that said, uh, the way that we farm is pleasing to me. And we have an internship program that I mentioned to you earlier that I think is very, very productive. Some people have come through that I'm very, very proud of. Uh, we do some uh, on-farm education. Uh, Gabe Brown has been gonna come back and talk to farmers and Spencer Smith. 
So it's Ben and he's going to come back and talk to farmers. I think those are two of the best there are out there. I think there's a lot of charlatans in this business and those are two that I I really trust and look up to and, and believe in. Uh, and we're looking at something right now. We've hired an education and events manager, a young woman to kind of flesh out some other, I'm gonna call it products to use to offer to people that want to learn how to farm that way. We, we're, we, we operate with full transparency. We built cabins on the farm so people could come and stay and look you can go anywhere you want to go, including the kill floor of the slaughterhouse. Uh, Paul, you know you've been, you've done it. Uh, we serve three meals a day, seven days a week. We welcome people to come and, and be with us. And we, we're very proud of what we do. Really enjoy showing it to people. So uh, Amy has a question that says, given our country's consumption of animal foods, uh, do you think there's enough land in our country to feed the population using regenerative practices? Uh, I don't think there's enough land in nine, who oh, got nine planets we know of? I don't think there's enough land on all nine planets to feed a population that's increasing exponentially uh, the way ours has been. I mean, the, the earth has a carrying capacity. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, I don't know if we're at it or over it or close to it, but the earth has a carrying capacity. And when we put more eaters on the earth than the carrying capacity will stand, the system, that's linear, and the system will fall. Now, I, as far as your question about land, I don't think that's quite fair because that assumes that land is the first thing we'll run out of. And if land is the first thing the system runs out of, my system may not be the best. But if petroleum is the first thing it runs out of, mine's better. If it's phosphate and potassium and other reductive minerals, mine's better. If it's good water that's not tainted, mine's better. If it's uh, antibiotics that the pathogens are not immune to, mine's better. If it's that dead zone down in the Gulf of Mexico, my mine's better. So I can go on and on with a lot of topsoil mines, but I can go on with a lot of scenarios where my system will feed more people than the industrial factory farm model. But if you insist on uh, saying that land's what we're gonna run out of, I, I'm probably second place. Uh, with that in mind, how would you answer folks that would uh, suggest adopting more of a vegetarian lifestyle in terms of eating to 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 do a part and uh, regen uh, reduce methane production from cattle? Well, I fully well that's two or three questions there, but I fully uh, I, I fully support the the right of any individual to eat what they want to eat. And that's a very personal choice, and. Uh, you know, if a person tells me that they don't eat meat because they can't bear the idea of eating protein that was once a living animal, I respect that. That's, that's fine. That's a lifestyle choice. Uh, if, if they tell me they don't eat meat because it's, it's, it's yucky in the mouthfeel, they just don't like it, I respect that. That's a lifestyle choice. But now I'm not going to let you tell me that you don't eat meat because it's destroying the planet. You can tell me you don't want to eat industrial meat because it's destroying the planet, and I'll agree with you. But uh, it is not okay to tell me that the way we do it, which has been scientifically proven to be part of the mitigation, uh, that's, that's unacceptable. That's, that's just not right. You can't have your own, you have your own lifestyle, your own opinion, you can't have your own facts. As you, uh, as you look forward to what's next and what's in the future, especially as you've got your daughters and your grandchildren around you, uh, what do you, do you have a vision for where White Oak Pastures is in 10, 20, 30 years? What, how, I mean, it'd probably be up to them, of course, uh, to some degree, but w what's your vision for what that looks like moving forward? I'm not even sure what I'm gonna eat for supper tonight. Uh, we, we have a, a uh, we have a direction that's that's really that we're entrenched in, and uh, we have a list of uh, 
projects that grows faster than our ability to cash flow them. We, we got a list of things we want to do. We have to be very judicious uh, in terms of cash and which ones we're going to do now, what we're going to do later, what we probably can't do. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, we have a great succession plan. You know, if, if, if I had died 10 or 15 years ago, it would have been game over for my family and my operation. Today, uh, I'm one of seven people that run the company. And if I keel over during this recording, it'll be all right. You know, we have a, a, a system in place to, to keep the farm going. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of a lot of old men try to run the operation from the grave. You know, want to dictate how it's going to be after I'm gone, and I won't be guilty of that. We've had several questions about the uh, your Iberico Pastures project. Um, can you speak to that? What it is? What it? What you? Where you're headed? And what uh, need that fulfills? Iberian Pastures is a separate company from White Oak Pastures, but it's operated here at White Oak Pastures. It's the only business I own that I don't own 100 percent of. I own 50 percent uh, in. 2014, I believe, uh, we imported 24 gilts and six boars. You know, a Spanish family, the Diorios or hog farmers in Spain, they did the heavy lifting for handling the exporting, importing of those 30 pigs. They brought them here. We've been raising them ever since. Uh, we, I think we've got about 150 sows now, and uh, I don't know how many pigs, a lot. And uh, we raise those hogs. We also have a, another hog operation that I own 100% of, we call the Heritage Hogs. It's Berkshire, Tamworth, Old Spots, Crossed Up. And those are our meat hogs. You know, with that, those are raised for pork chops and bacon and ham and ribs. The Iberian pigs are very fatty, lard type hog that's raised for uh, charcuterie, cured meats. You finish the Ibericos on a specific feed? Yeah. Uh, so so uh, in, you know, the, the old Spanish way was to feed, uh, finish the pigs in the fall on acorns. But that has not been the way of it for many, many years. My, uh, one of my daughters and her husband and one of my other directors and his wife went to Spain when we imported the pigs to kind of learn, figure it out, learn how it's done. And those Spanish nutritionists long ago uh, exploded the acorn and found out what the nutrients were, the fatty acids, the amino acid lipids, the amino acids to create that texture and flavor that is Iberico, uh, Hamon Iberico. I probably slaughtered that pronunciation, but you get my drift. Uh, we use the formula that the Spanish nutritionists use in Spain. And here it involves a lot of uh, peanuts and pecans. I do live in Georgia. Uh, do you raise uh, uh, vegetable plots as well, Will, or just uh, concentrating specifically on livestock? And if the answer is yes, then how do you, is there an integration aspect with livestock, vegetables, um, and rotations, those kinds of ideas? We do. Uh, we do raise certain amount of organic vegetables. It's not a big operation. We, and we used to, and then we got a very talented uh, young woman uh, that, that runs it very autonomously. And uh, I can't tell you much about it, except I know where it is. I know Sarah runs it. But uh, we used to go to farmer's markets, but you know, it's, it's three hours to Atlanta from White Oak Pastures. And we, we were not financially successful in doing that. So now she raises a lot of different things. I, I guess she probably farms about two and a half acres and she rotates around and, six, eight acres, ten acres of land, <clears throat> and we uh, sell what she produces. She, she produces beautiful vegetables. We sell them in the store. We cook with them in our restaurant. 
and we got a uh, what we call the commissary where we uh, do value added products. We, we make jerky and lard and tallow and those kinds of things there. And they also make for more vegetables, pickles and jelly and uh, uh, preserves and frozen. Uh, and so we, 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 we sell everything. What we don't <coughs> sell is rejects and feedback to the harvest. Okay. Uh, how is the uh, solar grazing with sheep going? That was a new project, not uh, not last yeah, last year, I believe, right? Uh, how's that going? Any any lessons learned initially? We've been on there about a year. <clears throat> uh, that's going really well. Still working out some bugs, but uh, we we've had no really no horror stories to tell. We're still figuring it out. <clears throat> Probably the the uh, probably the uh, things that uh, commanded the most attention is the fact that you know, these these fields, these solar arrays were built on degraded land, corn, cotton, peanut, corn, cotton, peanut, corn, cotton, peanut, uh, monoculture, rotated, but monocultures with a lot of cultivation, a lot of chemical fertilizer, a lot of pesticides. Land be about a half a percent organic matter. Then they made it a construction site and ran over it with heavy equipment for uh, a year and a half. It took, it took a long time to build it. <clears throat> so it was a truly degraded moonscape kind of a, a deal. And the, the problems that you would expect in getting uh, vegetation started in that environment is what it is. But uh, we've made a lot of progress in a year. And I think that in a few years, it's going to be a beautiful pasture. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with that. I think that's a, so I think that's going to be a growing uh, benefit for solar companies and for farmers. It makes me wonder, uh, and this may be the most difficult question of the night, but if you had, I mean, there's so many aspects of white oak pastures and, and your efforts, uh, both in terms of enterprises, but also, you know, the, what you're what you're working forward on. If if I asked you to pick one thing that you were the most proud of right now today, what would you say? Yes, that's the hardest question of the night. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm very proud that two of my daughters and their spouses came back here to work. I'm gonna say that probably take that probably take the cake on that deal. Uh, I'm very proud of the impact we've had on the local community. Uh, I'm very proud of uh, of the system that we built. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we we've been blessed. You know, I'm, I'm I'm a truly happy man. Uh, along the same lines, Joyce wants to know, uh, obviously, probably varying season to season, but is there a daily task that you would also consider to be uh, the most important for the day? Yeah, <laughs> going, going to the pasture. You know, uh, you know, my daddy said the best thing a best man can put on his land is his feet. And the best thing to put on his stock is his eyes. And I truly believe that, you know, you would uh, Things, uh, things just grow better when the land steward and herdsman has left his footprints of going to the pasture. You, you, I, I, I respond to emails and make phone calls and have meetings so I can go to the pasture. Okay. Well, we only have about uh, five minutes or so left. So um, if you were to wrap it up and provide parting words, uh, what, uh, what would you say to the folks as we wrap up this amazing session? Yeah, you know, Paul, uh, I, I'd invite you to come see us. You know, we, uh, we love to have, uh, yeah, I, I don't think, you know, I don't consider uh, speaking like this to be a skill set of mine. I tell people, if you want much polish, you ain't gonna get it. If you want some uh, authenticity and, uh, transparency you can get it and I can show it to you but I can tell you about it so we really do welcome visitors uh, we're right on the way to nowhere yeah I remember driving and just 
one or no, at some point I was either going to fall off the edge of the earth or get there, one of the two. So. You know, uh, uh, White Oak Pass is, uh, I use this to show how, how isolated and how sparse the population is, but we're one of the few places that you can, you know, east of the Mississippi, that you can be 50 miles from a Walmart. And uh, <laughs> I use that as, as a descriptive term, but also sort of bragging about it a little bit. All right. Uh, well, listen, this has been awesome. Uh, there were questions that I didn't get to. I was kind of trying to parse through some of them and, and stay a little higher level and less operational on purpose uh, for the purposes of a keynote. Uh, but that's my reminder to uh, remind everyone here uh, that you have a, a question and answer tomorrow uh, at 4.30 p.m. Uh, run, scheduled from 4.30 to 5.30. If you uh, have very anything, of course, but uh, detailed questions, operational type of questions that you'd like to talk to Will about, uh, that's your chance. So feel free to check that out within the Socio platform tomorrow, 4.30 to 5.30. Um, otherwise, uh, I'll toss it back to Carol for uh, any closing remarks for, from this keynote. Thanks again, Will. It's a real pleasure. Thank you, Paul. Good to see you. All right. Um... No, just thank you, uh, Paul, Will, if he's, if he's still there. Thank all of you for being with us this evening. We look forward to sharing the next few days with you. Um, and I probably don't need to tell you to drive safely tonight because uh, you're, not, you're not hopefully headed anywhere. So we will see you uh, again tomorrow. Have a good evening, everybody. <laughs>